Good to hear by the podium. Buenos días, my name is Hector Sanchez. I'm the executive director of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. We are a Latino labor organization, a constituency group of the AFL in Change to Win. We are here standing in solidarity uh, with representations of 22 different <coughs> international unions. We have a board of 45 members. And today we're united to send a very clear message when it comes to where do we stand as Latino and immigrant workers? Where do we stand as a labor movement when it comes to the important issue of trade? This is an issue in which NAF, LACLA, has been closely involved for the last 25 years. And today we're united here ahead of the 25th anniversary of NAFTA. And as the debate over NAFTA 2.0 is heating up, we're here to release a new report on NAFTA, that is the product of a, collaborate, a collaboration of two important organizations, obviously NACLA and Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. The data presented in this report on NAFTA's negative effect on working people in both, and I want to be very specific, in both the United States and Mexico, who pens Trump's xenophobic NAFTA narrative, which is premised on the notion that somehow NAFTA was a plot devised by Mexico to hurt U.S. workers. Trump's wrong-headed NAFTA story pits U.S. workers against their Mexican counterparts with Mexico whining and the U.S. winning, sorry, and the U.S. losing. In fact, as this report documents, and U.S., Mexican, and Canadian unions and consumer faith and environmental groups that fought against the North American Free Agreement enactment have spoilighted for the past two decades, NAFTA was the brainchild of U.S. president. It was negotiated by the input from hundreds of U.S. corporate trade advisors and has been devastating to working people in both Mexico and the United States. NAFTA was developed by and for multinational corporations seeking to pay workers less and has hurt both U.S. and Mexican workers. As a candidate, Donald Trump hijacked progressive critique of NAFTA's ongoing job outsourcing to win working class support with promises to renegotiate or end NAFTA. He mixed the hard facts on NAFTA damage with his narrative pitting U.S. workers against the Mexican counterpart and top in front of the anti-immigrant hatred. We are here all of us united to send a clear message that the labor movement stands with Latino workers in the UN, that we stand with Mexican workers, that we stand with immigrant workers. And while NAFTA harmed many US workers, and as this report documents, it disproportionately hurt Latino workers. Trump's xenophobic narrative about NAFTA ignores the damage the PAC has done to workers in Mexico, for example, a annual per capita income grew less than 2% in the first six years of NAFTA and less than 1% thereafter. Instead of higher wages promises, real average annual wages have declined in Mexico under NAFTA by 2% and the minimum wage down 14% from NAFTA uh, pre-NAFTA levels. And this is a very, very important fact. Manufacturing wages in Mexico are now 40% lower than in China. So it's a race to the bottom. This is not what we want for workers here. This is not what we want for workers anywhere. NAFTA devastated Mexican rural sector. About two million Mexicans engaged in farming and related work 
lost the livelihood as NAFTA eliminated policies protecting small workers, but didn't discipline U.S. farm workers subsidies, which are some of the highest subsidies that we have in the world. NAFTA's destruction of millions of Mexican small farmers' livelihoods and the PACs raised to the bottom wage incentives have pushed many in Mexico to search for work outside of their home country. From 1993, the year before NAFTA began, to 2000, annual immigration from Mexico increased from 370,000 to 770,000 uh, people. We need to take responsibility as a nation for the issue of immigration and stop blaming immigrants for this important issue. We have addiction to cheap, exploitable, disposable labor, and NAFTA is directly connected to what is happening on the issue of immigration. While it's not documented in this report, it is worth noting the same rural displacement occurred after CAFTA in the Central America Free Trade uh, Agreement as did increase in forced migration. Rather than recognizing that the U.S. trade policies have been a major push factor in immigration to the U.S., Trump has deployed seeing a mishmash of cruel actions to attempt to defer the third future immigration by separating children from their parents, spraying tear gas at refugees, and increasing rates on immigrant communities, and so on. With respect to the U.S. workers, almost one million U.S. jobs have been certified as lost to NAFTA under just one government program that undercounts NAFTA job loss, trade adjustment assistance. U.S. median wages are stagnant, with 40% of manufacturing workers who lose their jobs to trade, face, to trade facing major pay cuts if they find new employment. Among U.S. workers who are NAFTA, Latino workers have suffered disproportionate injury. The 15 states where 80% of Latinos resign account for nearly half of total NAFTA job loss certified under TAA. As NAFTA eliminates U.S. manufacturing jobs, wage stagnation for non-college educated workers across all industries kill Latinos asymmetrically. Rather than the Latino white pay gap closing, it increased during the NAFTA years. And this is very important from the Latino workers' perspective. But we want to set a, main, a very clear message of today standing in unity. Make no mistake, we are not against trade. We are against the trade agreements written by corporations to allow them to outsource production and play workers off to one another in a race to the bottom, in wages and stardust that concentrate well in the hands of very few. We are against vilifying immigrants whose livelihoods have been disrupted by biased economic policies, including trade agreements like RAFTA, and who are forced to leave their country to find work abroad. But there is a way forward. And as, a <clears throat> as you are going to hear today from many of our speakers, uh, and as we have outlined in our report, neither status quo neoliberalism nor Trump's hateful nationalism is the way forward for NAFTA 2.0. After a year of renegotiations, the NAFTA 2.0 text signed last week revealed some improvements, some damage in new terms, and much important unfinished business that the Donald Trump, Justin Trudeau, and Enrique Peña Nieto administration didn't deliver a transformation and replacement of the corporate rig trade pack model that NAFTA had in the early 1990s is no surprise. However, if the PAC's labor standards can be made to subject to SWIFT and certain enforcement and other key improvements are made, then the final package expected to head to Congress in 2019 could stop some of NAFTA's continuing serious damage to people across North America. Un par de palabras, veo algunos colegas de la prensa en español, un par de palabras en español. Este, somos el Consejo Sindical para el Avance del Trabajador Latinoamericano. Somos un espacio que representa los intereses de los trabajadores latinos y los trabajadores inmigrantes y muy cercano a todo el sindicalismo nacional con el AFL y Change to Win. 
como conjunto representamos eh, eh, como junta ejecutiva a 22 eh, eh, sindicatos internacionales y hoy estamos aquí para mandar un mensaje claro en relación al comercio y en relación al tratado de libre comercio. Se acerca el 25 el aniversario del tratado de libre comercio y estamos sacando un reporte, un reporte que se enfoca en los efectos negativos que el tratado de libre comercio ha tenido en la clase trabajadora en Estados Unidos, ha tenido en la clase trabajadora y los latinos y los inmigrantes en Estados Unidos, pero también el impacto negativo que ha tenido en la clase trabajadora mexicana. Es muy claro que Trump manipuló el mensaje del comercio y trató de culpar a México. Este reporte muestra que estos tratados eh, han sido creados y fueron creados inicialmente por presidentes aquí en Estados Unidos, y los únicos espacios que tuvieron algo que decir en las mesas de negociaciones fueron las corporaciones. Es un problema muy serio que nosotros vemos eh, después de casi 25 años, porque la concentración de la riqueza en México y la concentración de la riqueza en Estados Unidos ha alcanzado números históricos, y esto tiene una correlación directa con tratados de libre comercio que principalmente han beneficiado a las corporaciones y han creado este tipo de concentración de la riqueza. Queremos mandar un mensaje claro hoy que la realidad es que el tratado de libre comercio fue malo para la clase trabajadora en Estados Unidos, pero también para la clase trabajadora en México. El poder de compra y los salarios bajaron en ambos lados. La inmigración se incrementó debido directamente al tratado de libre comercio. Y queremos mandar un mensaje que debemos de dejar la hipocresía nacional de culpar solamente a los inmigrantes por el tema de inmigración. Tenemos una responsabilidad como nación, como Estados Unidos, en el tema de la inmigración y la raíz del problema. Tenemos una adicción a la mano de obra barata. Tenemos una adicción a la mano de obra explotable. Debemos de dejar esa hipocresía nacional de culpar a los inmigrantes y a nuestros vecinos por estos temas y tomar responsabilidades por las políticas que implementamos. Y el Tratado de Libre Comercio es un ejemplo de estas políticas que han empujado, que han sacado a las comunidades en México y Centroamérica de sus comunidades eh, y tomar responsabilidad por estos temas con mejores tratados de libre comercio. Hay ejemplos como el tratado en la Unión Europea, donde creían en el comercio, donde creían en el movimiento de inversiones, pero al mismo tiempo bajaron esas barreras para que hubiera circulación de gente entre esos países. Aquí lo que hicimos fue lo opuesto y construimos más barreras para que no se puedan mover las personas en ese país. Nosotros apoyamos un comercio justo y como mis colegas van a explicar, apoyamos comercio en donde la prioridad se dé para los trabajadores principalmente. Y now it is my real honor to introduce somebody that exemplifies everything that we believe as an organization. Somebody that is an immigrant, the first woman elected to lead this fantastic organization, somebody that migrated from El Salvador and our leader, Janira Merino. She's LACLA's national president. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an important issue, uh, not only as an immigrant myself, but workers. Workers here and workers in, in the United States. My name is Janira Merino. I'm the national president of LACLA. Thanks for introducing me. Side by side with this uh, expansive data showing NAFTA disproportionate damage to U.S. Latino workers and Mexican workers. The report also gives us the stories of workers that have been affected by the policies of these trade agreements. Uh, one of those workers is Maria Jimenez from the border town of El Paso in Texas, who lost her job making blue jeans after the apparel industry moved to Mexico to take advantage of the low wages. El Paso has, more, has the most certified uh, NAFTA job losses of any city in the country. Yes, I'm not talking about um, Ohio or Detroit. I'm talking about El Paso, mm -hmm. a U.S. border city that is 80% Latino. Mm -hmm. Maria thought she, that she had achieved the American dream before she was laid off when Levi's relocated its production to Mexico under NAFTA. Since then, she has struggled finding a new, a new work. And certainly, she had never again had a job like the one she had 
that allowed her to and her family to have a middle class life. Another story that we see in this, uh, in this report is the report of Jose Bernardo Magdaleno Velasco. He farms in Chiapas, Mexico. NAFTA had almost destroyed his livelihood uh, as a subsidized US core imports flooded the Mexican market after NAFTA. He speaks about har the hardly making ends meet and the, the hardship his family suffer as the prices of his corn plummet after NAFTA. He tries to shift to what he calls the NAFTA production methods, using chemicals to try to squeeze more corn out of his land. Th these chemicals have made him ill now, and still the price he is paid for his corn can barely cover his medical bills. These are only two of the tens of millions of Mexican and US Latino workers hurt by NAFTA. And this is the future, it is the future of these workers and their families and their communities that will, that will be determined by whether there is a new NAFTA deal that can raise wages and replace the NAFTA race to the bottom, bottom with, a trade, um, with a fair trade one. El, el Concilio de Trabajadores, uh, de, para el avance de los trabajadores latinos, está acá para decir que nuestras voces han estado y van a seguir estando mientras veamos que las políticas en las negociaciones de estos tratados de libre comercio siguen evadiendo tener la presencia de los trabajadores y las sociedades civiles, que son los más as, 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 afectados después de que estos programas sean firmados. Seguimos diciendo que estamos aquí porque nuestro papel es de jugar ¿verdad? y proteger y hablar de cómo estas políticas realmente afectan a los trabajadores latinoamericanos, latinos en los Estados Unidos. Por los cuales nosotros hablamos y por los cuales nosotros pedimos políticas que les permitan tener trabajos dignos. No queremos historias como las de María Jiménez en El Paso o de Bernardo Magdaleno Velasco en Chiapas. Queremos Políticas que le ofrezcan a nuestros trabajadores, a todos los trabajadores latinoamericanos y todos los que estamos aquí, por supuesto en México, trabajado, trabajos con dignidad, capaces de sostener a sus familias y tener el sueño, no solo el sueño americano, pero el sueño mexicano en México. Por eso estamos aquí y deci decir también que seguiremos en solidaridad con los trabajadores mexicanos. Esa es nuestra voz, ese es nuestro deseo y por eso trabajamos. Gracias. Now we have a great brother from our board, Guillermo Perez. He's a labor educator with the United Steel Workers, and he's also the president of our LACLA chapter in Pittsburgh. Guillermo. Muchas gracias. Um, a very important story contained in this report that relates to my union is emblematic of how NAFTA turns middle class jobs into sweatshop jobs and why NAFTA 2.0 labor enforcement must be greatly strengthened. In 2017, U.S. multinational tire manufacturer Goodyear decided to build a state-of-the-art tire factory in San Luis Potosi, Mexico, rather than expanding production in the United States. At the new Mexican plant, 800 workers earn less than $2 an hour in a facility that is a clone of a U.S. plant, where workers represented by my union, the steel workers, are paid an average of $26 an hour to make the same product. In April 2018, 600 of Goodyear's Mexican workers went on strike to protest low wages and dangerous working conditions. Soon after, many were fired for violating, and I say this in quotes, the contract that the workers had never voted on, and to which, and but to which a fake protection union, un sindicato blanco, como dicen en México, a fake protection union had agreed. These workers are now fighting to get their jobs back and implement a genuine collective bargaining agreement. The struggle of Goodyear workers in Mexico is emblematic of the broader fight against Mexico's protection union and protection contracts. Protection here relates to the practice of companies in Mexico protecting against having real unions that represent workers by signing contracts with labor organizations that are affiliated with Mexico's business-friendly political parties and registering those fake contracts to fulfill the requirement in Mexico's constitution for many workplaces to have unions. 
It is in the interest of workers in all three countries to ensure that Mexico adopts strong workers' rights provisions and monitors and enforces their implementation. Workers in Mexico must be able to form labor organizations, independent, democratic labor organizations, and collectively bargain for better wages and working conditions to stop downward pressure on wages in Canada and the United States. The NAFTA 2.0 has some useful language to, this, to stop the plague of protection unions in Mexico, but unless these terms are subject to swift and certain enforcement, which is not the case in the text signed last week, conditions won't improve for workers in Mexico or here in the United States or Canada. <coughs> in conclusion, um, uh, para terminar, quiero comp compartir con ustedes un dicho que nosotros tenemos eh, en Pittsburgh, en nuestro Black Black Chapter allá en Pittsburgh. Las luchas obreras no tienen fronteras. Y esta lucha sobre NAFTA sigue. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Guillermo, y gracias por todo tu trabajo. I want to introduce a sister that is one of the most powerful women in the national labor movement and the first Latina to be secretary treasurer of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, our sister Dora Cervantes. Good morning. My name is Dora Cervantes, and I am with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, representing about 700,000 members in the uh, U.S. and Canada. The Machinist Union makes, maintains, we transport, and we service the products that create the global economy. We know how important the global economy is to our jobs and our communities. We also know firsthand that trade agreements like NAFTA, which are not fair and leave workers in the US, Canada, and Mexico out in the cold, have caused immense pain and disruption in the lives of everyday working people in all three countries. In order to take advantage of manufacturing jobs that are held below $3 an hour, US and Canadian companies have moved jobs to Mexico on an unprecedented, unprecedented scale since NAFTA was implemented. In the case of just one industry, the machinist represents, Mexico now employs between 30,000 and 40,000 aerospace workers and has become a major exporter to the US. The U.S. International Trade Commission has reported that Mexico's low labor costs in aerospace has contributed to the outsourcing of U.S. work. Recently, and yet another aerospace company, United Technologies in Chula Vista, in Chula Vista California, announced it will be closing its doors and leaving 300 workers out of a job. Work that was performed by U.S. workers is already in Mexico. The company has even showcased its operations in Mexico. Other aerospace companies like General Electric, Honeywell, Cessna, and many other U.S. companies in aerospace and other manufacturing industries, as well as Canadian and European companies, have also flocked to Mexico. The importance of aerospace to our nation's economy and security cannot be overstated. Aerospace and its related industries are responsible for a significant portion of our exports and hundreds and thousands of high-skilled, high-paid jobs. The aerospace industry has also led the development of new and innovative technologies that have in turn led to new industries. Given the critical nature of aerospace to our nation's future, the continued outsourcing of U.S. production and technology to Mexico must be effective, effectively addressed once and for all. I wanted to focus on aerospace, some of our nation's high-tech, high-skilled manufacturing jobs, because there's a myth that NAFTA only costs low-skilled, low-tech jobs to move to Mexico. Many industries that should be providing the high-tech jobs of the future here have also outsourced work to Mexico to take advantage of its low labor costs derived from suppressing basic workers' rights. The NAFTA 2.0 that, that was signed will not stop the wage suppression in Mexico and the related outsourcing from the U.S. and Canada. Our future 
the future of manufacturing and the future of workers' lives depends on getting trade policy. We need a comprehensive trade agreement that will protect all workers, that will, that will maintain a living wage for all workers across all borders. And like my brother stated, labor doesn't have borders. Thank you. Okay. I want to introduce uh, Lori Waller. She's the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, and uh, this is an organization that has been a partner of LACLA for a long time, and we're very happy to also collaborate on this uh, report again. Lori. Thank you, Hector. As all of the previous speakers have pointed out, the 25 years of NAFTA has been a catastrophe for working people on both sides of the border. And the report being released today that documents the outcome makes clear that Donald Trump's hateful juxtaposition of Mexican workers versus U.S. workers, Mexico versus the U.S., is not the real story of NAFTA. NAFTA was designed by and for big companies to take advantage of workers. It has rules that makes it possible to pay workers less. And this report that documents the damage done to working people in Mexico, the damage done to working people in the U.S., and the overrepresentation of Latino workers in the U.S. amongst the workers hurt in the U.S. shows the universality of the damage to working people by an agreement that was constructed to have the impact of keeping down wages. So now, as we look at what will come next, we know that the NAFTA 2.0 text that was just signed, makes some improvements we've demanded, but it adds some things that make NAFTA worse. And there's a lot of unfinished business. So as all of the speakers and the reports have documented, it is critical to get the NAFTA 2.0 to replace NAFTA, to get it right, because the damage is ongoing. This isn't a story of damage of the 90s. This is damage that's ongoing to working people in the US and Mexico every week every day. So it is, Public Citizen has been very pleased to work with LACLA to bring to light the impacts of NAFTA on both sides of the border. And this report makes very clear what my friends and colleagues have been saying. Neither NAFTA's status quo of neoliberalism or Trump's wrong-headed, misdirected nationalism and hatred is the answer going forward for working people. So what would it take to have a trade agreement that works for working people? The draft that was signed is not on its own going to stop the outsourcing of jobs that turns middle class jobs into sweatshop jobs. It's not gonna raise wages in Mexico, which is the necessary element to stop NAFTA's reverse alchemy of taking good jobs and turning them into low wage jobs. It's not going to make it possible for people to have access to a clean environment for their families or affordable medicines. In fact, if implemented as is, it could raise medicine prices. So working together, there's a broad coalition across this country, united in demanding the changes that are necessary to the NAFTA text, and working with Democrats in Congress, demanding the changes that are necessary to the text that Trump signed to ensure that a minimum, it, ba it passes the basic test of stopping NAFTA's ongoing damage. And that is gonna take a lot more work. We are united in fighting for that. We will fight to make these changes because if we don't, the damage will continue. Trump simply canceling NAFTA withdrawing will not bring back a single one of the million US manufacturing jobs that have been lost. Will not get rid of the Sindicatos Blancos, the yellow unions, as we would call them here, the fake unions. It's not going to raise wages in Mexico. We have to get the right agreement and passed in order to change the damage. And that is our mission. And the report lays out an ample set of evidence of why we must succeed united together. Thank you. Gracias, Lori. Now we're gonna take some questions from the press. Hector, uh, well, to everybody, I mean, I guess we can all agree that, uh, that the new NAFTA, the new trade agreement is a forced negotiation by Trump right now, uh, how do you, how you, are you concerned about the fact that Trump is now threatening to terminate the, 
overturn NAFTA quickly so that pressure in Congress to ratify the new agreement uh, would affect all the improvements you all want to make or you would like to see in the community. Laurie, do you mind? So, first of all, the president's threat, it's unclear what exactly he's saying, because the way that Article 2205 of NAFTA works, which is the article under which any country can give notice to withdraw from the agreement, it requires, under any circumstances, six months' written notice. So, as it comes to pass, it would not be highly improbable that were the improvements made to NAFTA and a vote that happened on the improved NAFTA that might actually stop the damage wouldn't happen until June anyway. So six months from when he would give notice, it's unclear what exactly the threat is. As well, in Argentina, when the agreement was signed, a protocol of replacement was signed. Maybe he's referring to that. That's an agreement between the three countries that explicitly says when the new agreement goes into effect, NAFTA and the U.S.-Canada agreement of 1988 die. So maybe he's referring to that. They did actually just terminate. It's just terminated, conditioned on when it goes into effect. It's unclear what the threat is, but what is certain is that historically, when trade agreements have not been able to get a majority in Congress, which I suspect this one as is, without stronger labor enforcement, etc., could not get through the House, then they've been renegotiated. And despite the myth of you can't change an agreement, in fact, historically, George W. Bush changed the Singapore agreement first. Then George W. Bush was forced when the Democrats took a majority in 2006, and he'd signed three agreements, Panama, Peru, and Colombia, to renegotiate all three of those on a very similar issues to what shortcomings in NAFTA with respect to taking out new goodies for big pharmaceutical companies that would raise medicine prices and cut off consumers, and to add environmental and labor standards. That was 2006. Then agreements passed in 2007. And then Obama had to renegotiate the Korea agreement that Bush too had signed five years before he got there in order to get that through Congress. So that's the normal course of business, and whether the time will accommodate, if Trump gave notice today, I suspect but by June it could be fixed and passed, but who knows if that's what he's actually doing. Laurie, I have a follow-up on, on your, um, so you've outlined what you want to see, how you want this new uh, NAFTA 2.0 fixed, have you been in touch with Democrats that are and Republicans that are also skeptical, given that both chambers have to pass this agreement? And I've heard from several that the, they're not happy with the new text. So what are you guys doing in terms of active lobbying on the Hill um, to get those changes need, uh, done? Let me just pull out all the details of the strategy. No, I'm kidding. The, um, whoops, someone leaned against the light. The, um, the answer is that we, in a way, don't need to be lobbying because the Democrats in Congress have made clear since the NAFTA renegotiation started last August what the criteria were for the ideal agreement. As Ector said, we're not there, we're not close to that. But they also made clear what was necessary simply to stop NAFTA's ongoing damage. And that's the standard given who's president, I would suspect, that the Democrats are currently aspiring to as it's an important outcome to stop the continuing damage and it's a realistic one. And it coincidentally is one that the president promised he himself was going to achieve. So many Democrats, before they have to hear a word from any of us, already have been laying out specifically that improvements, the ones that I just mentioned, strengthening the enforcement of the labor environmental standards, improving the labor and environmental standards, taking out the giveaways to big pharma that actually would lock into place high medicine prices in the US and export our bad system to Mexico and Canada, something that is particularly perilous politically after a midterm election under which 40 seats changed in no small part over a fight over accessible medicine and the greed of big pharma. So these are not, the, the changes that are needed are not surprising and the Democrats don't need to be pushed into them because they've been saying the same thing for a year and three months and that's the measuring stick that they will apply. Just as a sort of historical note, it's sort of worth thinking about the fact that the last time Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House, she was the lady who actually helped negotiate with a, with a Republican president 
to make changes to a signed trade agreement, the Peru Agreement, to try and get it to have bipartisan support when the difference after it was signed was the Democrats took the House, the agreement was signed under a Republican Congress, and then she was the lady who actually passed the Peru Free Trade Agreement by the largest bipartisan majority that any U.S. free trade agreement has ever passed. Lori, if I may follow up uh, quickly, uh, do you think the, the House majority would be enough to, you know, considering we have a divided Congress, to, to be able to ram through some of these changes you want? Uh, it is my sense that there will be very strong United Democratic demands to make the improvements necessary to ensure that the agreement lives up to the potential of what the Democrats have asked for. So for instance, the improvements, and there are some in the labor standards, if they're not subject to enforcement, you only have paper. And the Democrats have seen over and over when they've tried to improve the labor standards that they're not, that they are not guaranteed to have swift and certain enforcement, they have nothing. And the damage has been so broad, so nationwide. I mean, the notion that El Paso, Texas, 30,000 certified jobs and not a huge city in just one location. It's the, the damage is across the country. It's not just the Rust Belt story. In fact, California slammed the aerospace jobs. So many of the Hughes aircraft and other jobs, if you look at the certifications, high-end manufacturing, clean manufacturing of computer parts, of ROM, all being done in California, outsourced, beautiful new plants now being built in Mexico, really hard-working workers in Mexico in a high-tech plant, that is a cookie cutter, as we heard from our brother from the steel workers, just like the tire plant, cookie cutter plant, difference, workers in the US making 30 to 25 to 30 dollars an hour, workers in Mexico making two or three dollars an hour. That kind of race to the bottom, absent enforceable labor standards, is not gonna stop. And so I see the Democrats quite hopeful about the opportunity to get the changes that they need, given the agreement that was signed does not yet meet that standard. No, we're really going to get off the <laughs> <laughs> So, gracias, Lori. Let's take one more question because we need to go back to our board meeting and then we can do one on ones. Any other question? Thank you, everybody. And uh, we look forward to continue collaborating on having trade agreements that are more inclusive of the priorities of workers' rights in the nation. Muchas gracias.